The invention of nuclear weapons ranks as one of the key developments in human history. For the first time, all-out warfare risked not only the destruction of civilization, but the radioactive poisoning of the planet itself. America's attacks against the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945 demonstrated that the catastrophic effects of even a small atomic bomb were horrific in the extreme. After the atomic bomb blast that virtually erased this city of 340,000 people from the earth, as far as the eye can see, stretch scenes of desolation and ruin. Four square miles leveled by one bomb. Fearing widespread destruction in the days ahead, and shocked by the simultaneous invasion of its territory by the Soviet Union, the Japanese government quickly surrendered, thereby ending World War II. Less than a year later, the U.S. military detonated two more atomic bombs during Operation Crossroads, conducted at the newly created Pacific Proving Grounds. By then, the Soviets, once allies of the U.S., were considered a threat to the Western democracies in the post-war world. President Harry Truman and his advisors concluded that America's possession of large numbers of atomic weapons would keep the Russian communists in check and authorized crash programs devoted to ongoing testing and mass production. On August 29, 1949, the Soviet Union detonated its own atomic bomb much sooner than expected. The nuclear arms race had begun in earnest. To make matters worse, by the early 1950s, the newly invented hydrogen bombs, some of them a thousand times more powerful than atomic weapons, began to be tested in remote areas of the planet by the new nuclear superpowers and their allies. Mankind's future never looked bleaker. Intriguingly, this grim state of affairs led to a still unexplained mystery. As difficult as this will be for some people to accept, evidence uncovered by researchers confirms that technologically advanced observers, whose identity and intentions remain unknown, began to monitor the nuclear standoff almost from the start. Declassified U.S. government documents reveal that as early as December 1948, incursions by mysterious aerial objects later referred to as UFOs, began to occur at American nuclear laboratories, bomb storage depots, weapons test areas, and, as time went on, intercontinental ballistic missile sites. Particularly dramatic are the incidents now being openly discussed by former U.S. Air Force ICBM launch officers who were stationed at various strategic air command bases in the 1960s and 70s. According to these highly credible witnesses, on some occasions, as the UFOs briefly hovered over their launch facilities, the nuclear missiles inexplicably malfunctioned. The officers had been on alert in their underground launch control capsules when they received telephone calls from their security guards at ground level, saying that they were observing one or more unidentified disc-shaped craft maneuvering in the sky. Seconds later, as many as 10 ICBMs suddenly shut down, according to warning lights on the officers' missile readiness consoles, meaning that they could not have been launched if the President of the United States had, at that moment, ordered a nuclear attack on America's adversaries. These witnesses say that their superiors ordered them to keep quiet about the incidents, and in some cases, required them to sign non-disclosure statements which stipulated severe legal penalties for anyone who violated secrecy.
As a result of the harsh security measures imposed upon them, many of these Air Force veterans waited decades before discussing the nearly unbelievable and highly disturbing incidents they had observed. Nevertheless, a number of them have finally stepped forward to reveal the truth. On September 27, 2010, a leading UFO researcher, Robert Hastings, and a former Minuteman missile launch officer, Robert Salas, co-sponsored the UFOs and Nukes press conference in Washington, D.C., in an effort to bring the facts to the public. The event was widely covered by the media, not only in the United States, but around the world. CNN streamed it live, and other major news organizations published stories about it later the same day. Good afternoon, my name is Robert Salas. In uh, 1967, I was a first lieutenant uh, stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana. I was a missile launch officer. Sometime in the evening hours on March 24th, I received a call from one of my topside guards, the flight security controller, stating that they had been observing strange lights in the sky, making odd maneuvers. He called back uh, about five minutes later this time he was screaming into the phone saying uh, they're uh, looking at a red glowing object hovering just above our front gate. Our missiles began going into what's called a no-go condition or unlaunchable. Essentially, they were disabled while this object was still uh, hovering over our site. Back in 1967, I was officer in charge of the communications center at the 28th Air Division in Great Falls, Montana. In March of that particular year, I can clearly recall a message coming through my communications center, which basically said that a UFO did in fact shut down several missile silos in Montana. Robert Hastings has devoted 40 years to seeking out and interviewing U.S. military veterans regarding their UFO experiences at missile sites and other nuclear weapons facilities. His book, UFOs and Nukes, contains the testimony of more than 100 of those individuals. Declassified U.S. government documents and witness testimony from former or retired U.S. military personnel confirm beyond any doubt the reality of ongoing UFO incursions at nuclear weapons sites. I was the Minuteman III Combat Crew Commander at F.E. Warren Air Force Base, Wyoming. In 1976, my deputy, Bill, and I were on alert. We contacted our FSC, our flight security controller, and asked him, is there something wrong? And he said, right above him was a big white object that was cigar-shaped, 80 to 100 feet above him, 40 to 50 feet long. I said, OK, keep, a, keep me abreast of what's happening. So we were talking for a while, stayed there for, I don't know, minute, minute and a half, and it slowly and very silently moved along the access road. When we came up the next morning, the FSC was in his chair in a fetal position, and we talked to him and tried to calm him down. We couldn't calm him down, oddly enough. We were called in by the, uh, the squadron commander again, and he took whatever notes my deputy made, tore him up. So this didn't happen, it's top secret, and made a sign something. Significantly, dramatic UFO incidents were also occurring at nuclear missile facilities in the former Soviet Union, including cases where the weapons suddenly malfunctioned. Documents obtained in Russia by Western journalists in the 1990s, as well as on-the-record statements by Soviet Army veterans, summarize the unsettling events in great detail. These revelations make clear that both American and Soviet nuclear missiles were subjected to ongoing surveillance and, from time to time, deliberate tampering by whoever was piloting the UFOs during the long, tense confrontation known as the cold, amazing aerial craft we call UFOs. And why do they seemingly have an intense interest in monitoring and sometimes disrupting our nuclear weapons systems? A brief review of the evidence may provide a few clues. U.S. government documents released through the Freedom of Information Act 
confirm that unidentified aerial objects, described as flying disks and flying saucers, began to be sighted around the Los Alamos Atomic Laboratory in New Mexico, the birthplace of nuclear weapons, as early as December 1948. Three years earlier, on July 16, 1945, the lab had tested the first atomic bomb in the desert near Alamogordo, just weeks before the devastating attacks against Japan. Although shrouded in secrecy for decades, the declassified documents reveal that UFOs appeared with alarming frequency, not only at Los Alamos, but also at its sister laboratory, Sandia, in Albuquerque throughout the 1950s. Other declassified documents discuss ongoing UFO sightings at the Oak Ridge Nuclear Laboratory in Tennessee. The Hanford Plutonium Processing Plant in Washington State. And the Savannah River Complex, another plutonium manufacturing site in South Carolina. While the local and even national media occasionally published stories about these incidents, the vast majority of the American public had no idea that they were so frequent and widespread. Nevertheless, according to military intelligence officers, a worrisome pattern had begun to emerge. On July 1, 1952, Look magazine featured an article, Hunt for the Flying Saucer, about the Air Force's new UFO investigations group, Project Blue Book, and noted that its director, First Lieutenant Edward Ruppelt, had plotted 63 unexplained sightings on a map of the United States. At that point, it was discovered that a, quote, ominous correlation existed between some of the sightings and the location of various atomic weapons installations. Later that year, the CIA took notice of the situation, as this memorandum reveals. Dr. H. Marshall Chadwell, assistant director of the agency's Office of Scientific Intelligence, wrote, quote, sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes and traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles. UFOs also visited the newly created Nevada Proving Ground, located 60 miles northwest of Las Vegas, where new and improved atomic devices were being tested. Civilians living near the Proving Ground often observed the aerial disks, sometimes flying in large formations, and subsequently notified the Air Force and the local media. At the same time, U.S. Army personnel engaged in field maneuvers at the test site, designed to expose them to atomic battlefield conditions, also reported seeing the UFOs. Meanwhile, other sightings were occurring at the remote Pacific Proving Grounds, where ongoing tests of the far more destructive hydrogen bombs were taking place, as the U.S. tried to outpace the Soviets in the new technology of warfare. The chief purpose of the nuclear tests was to create a powerful but lightweight bomb that could be easily transported aboard an aircraft, the primary delivery system during that era. Had the United States been attacked by the Soviet Union, the U.S. Air Force planned to launch hundreds of strategic bombers against that country and its communist allies. Flying over the Arctic region, they would deliver their deadly payloads a few hours later. At the same time, Soviet bombers would be racing toward North America and Western Europe, carrying their own hydrogen bombs, intent on massive retaliation. If this were not enough, the nuclear standoff entered a new and even more menacing phase in the early 1960s, with the first deployment of intercontinental ballistic missiles. Traveling at more than 15,000 miles per hour, these space-age weapons could deliver their massively destructive warheads to targets on the other side of the globe in less than half an hour. That shockingly brief period was later reduced to less than 10 minutes once U.S. and Soviet missile-carrying submarines began to be deployed just off each other's coasts. Nuclear Armageddon, if it came to pass, 
would burst upon the world with sudden savagery against which there would be no possible defense. Perhaps predictably, declassified documents reveal that UFO sightings at nuclear missile launch facilities began to occur as early as 1962. My crew was on alert at uh, Missile Complex 7. Major Gilbert, my crew commander, and I were uh, manning the launch console. We got a call from the Site 6 crew commander saying that there's something hovering above his site. And he asked us to go topside and see what we could see. So Major Gilbert sent our three enlisted men to uh, what we call the CAP which was the uh, top side of the uh, launch control center. They reported to us that they saw a light above site six that rapidly accelerated and stopped instantly above the area where site eight was located and went back and forth. It was instant go, instant stop. That object did things that no airplane, helicopter, or any other system that we had in existence could do. It had to be not of this earth. Air Force security personnel guarding these sensitive sites reported seeing unknown aerial objects, usually described as disc-shaped, maneuvering at low altitude and sometimes even hovering over launch silos and launch control facilities at every ICBM base in the United States. Often, the UFOs were tracked on radar, performing maneuvers vastly beyond the capability of any man-made aircraft. Experienced radar personnel were stunned as the objects flew thousands of miles per hour, made sharp angled turns, and instantly stopped in midair. The mysterious intruders were frequently chased by Air Force interceptors, which had been scrambled to protect the missiles from possible sabotage. So far as is known, the UFOs always escaped unscathed, usually by vastly increasing their speed and leaving the fighters far behind. Baffled military officials had to deal with these unexplained and alarming incidents on an ongoing basis, while trying their best to keep the facts from leaking out to their fellow Americans many of whom believed the UFO phenomenon to be a nonsensical subject, having no basis in reality. This skeptical attitude was actively fostered by the government's own policy of ridicule and denial, as implemented by members of Project Blue Book, who routinely dismissed credible, bona fide UFO sightings as the misidentifications of natural phenomena or man-made aircraft. Over time, this practice led to a widespread public backlash against the U.S. government and its weak and sometimes ridiculous explanations for the sightings. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, UFOs began to appear at missile test ranges, often during launches designed to improve the performance and reliability of America's ICBMs and the deadly warheads they carried. Occasionally, those aboard the UFOs did more than watch the tests. While the exact date remains uncertain, sometime in the fall of 1964, an incident occurred at Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, which has come to be the best known, most astonishing example of deliberate UFO interference with our nuclear weapons systems. Although the case is still classified top secret, a former Air Force officer Dr. Robert Jacobs has openly discussed it. At the time, Lieutenant Jacobs, who was assigned to the 1369th Photographic Squadron and held the title Officer in Charge of Photo Instrumentation, was tasked with filming missile launches from a remote mountaintop site on California's Big Sur coastline using a powerful telescopic camera. The ascending ICBMs would initially fill the camera frame, permitting a detailed view of engine performance, staging, and other aspects of a given launch as they raced out over the Pacific Ocean. Following one such test launch, 
Lieutenant Jacobs was unexpectedly told to report to the office of Major Florenz Mansman, a photographic analyst assigned to Vandenberg's Office of the Chief Scientist, 1st Strategic Aerospace Division. Upon arriving, he noticed two mysterious men in gray suits, who he later learned were CIA officers. A motion picture projector had been set up, and without explanation, Major Mansman turned it on, telling Jacobs, Watch this. Jacobs, later a university professor, describes what happened next. On the screen was the film we had shot. The nose cones separate. The chaff flew out in front of it. We saw this as obviously reflections of light rippling like that. And then we saw the dummy warhead flying along. It's going between six and 8,000 miles an hour at that point. And it's on the, the, the fringe of space. And suddenly into that, that frame, an object flew in chasing the chaff, the warhead and so on at the same speed. And in polar orbit, it fired a beam of light at the warhead. The, the beam of light struck that. The object flew up, shot another beam of light at the dummy warhead, went around, shot another beam of light at it, went down, shot a beam of light, and then flew out the same way to come in. At which time, the dummy warhead fell out of the frame. The lights came on, and Major Mansman said to me, were you guys screwing around up there? And I said, no, sir. And he said, what was that? And I said, it looks like we got a UFO. And he said, Lieutenant Jacobs, you are never to speak of this again. It never happened. Decades later, Dr. Mansman, by then a researcher at Stanford University, informed Dr. Jacobs that after he had left the room, the two CIA officers quickly confiscated the film of the amazing incident, telling Mansman that it was classified top secret. Mansman also confirmed in letters to various researchers that before the film was whisked away, he had conducted an extensive frame-by-frame -frame analysis of it using a magnifier, which revealed the UFO in great detail. He wrote, quote, the shape was a classic disc. The center seemed to be a raised bubble. The entire lower saucer shape was glowing and seemed to be rotating slowly. At the point of beam release, the object turned like it was required to be in a position to fire from a platform. The assumption was, at that time, extraterrestrial. Responding to the retired major's revelations, Dr. Jacobs wrote, quote, those beams of light were a warning, a shot fired across the bow of our nuclear silliness ship. Then, on August 1st, 1965, a dramatic, large-scale UFO incursion took place at F.E. Warren Air Force Base in Wyoming, as this declassified report confirms. Dozens of sightings of disc-shaped craft cavorting at low altitude over Minuteman missile silos, known as launch facilities, were reported by the Air Force security personnel guarding them. Former launch officer Jay Earnshaw has discussed his involvement in one such incident that night. I was in command of capsule Echo 1 at Warren Air Force Base. Got a call about 3.30 in the morning, somewhere at that time, from the flight security controller above, who said that, sir, there's some strange objects out there. I says, what do you mean? And turns out that he had observed, along with the rest of his uh, response team members, what looked like five to six oblong lights stacked on top of one another, just outside the gate at Echo One. They didn't seem to cause any particular damage. They didn't seem to put out any beams of light or anything else like that. They simply were there, stacked up. It was rather a benign incident at the time. The uh, paperwork all disappeared. Over the next two years, similar UFO incursions also took place at Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, and Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota. Although those disturbing incidents were reported in official records at the time, and occasionally leaked to the media, many of the details only emerged decades later in the testimony of former missile launch officers. 
I was on duty at, at ECHO, which is our squadron command post. We had strike teams respond to alarms from the missiles. They were three to five miles away. And they jumped in their trucks and went roaring out there and called me back and said, sir, for lack of a better description, there's a flying saucer hovering over that missile and there's a beam of reddish light going down to it. I assumed they were taking data with that beam. It wasn't destructive as far as I know. It had to be a data collection thing. I'm sure they scanned the warhead or something. Like that. Although the Air Force could not yet know it, the most dramatic nuclear weapons related UFO incidents were about to occur. During the pre-departure crew briefing, uh, it was mentioned that some missiles at November flight had gone off alert. We reached the launch control facility. We entered the gate after giving the appropriate password and the above ground personnel briefed us on what had happened. And essentially, uh, we were told by site manager that an object had been sighted uh, out the windows with flashing lights and it was probably about 80 to 100 feet in diameter. It then went to our main gate where it hovered and uh, when we debriefed the underground launch crew, uh, they indicated that all the missiles that they controlled had gone off alert at the time that object had been hovering next to the main gate. My crew commander, Major Tallerud, told me that he had received a call overnight, evidently while I was on rest break below ground, and saying that we, we as a crew were never to speak about this again. This was a very serious incident. I mean, something to take our nuclear tipped missiles off alert. Uh, it was something that we had never been prepared for. The same year that these amazing events were unfolding in secrecy, Secretary of the Air Force Harold Brown appeared before a congressional hearing and dismissed the idea that information about UFOs was being kept from the American public. We have not been hiding anything. The investigations have been made public. The explanations of those where there is a clear explanation have been made public. The hearing this morning was public for just that reason. Brown's claims have now been discredited, but the strict security measures imposed on military witnesses at the time meant that decades would pass before the public learned the facts about UFO activity at nuclear missile sites. In any case, the next known incident, at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana, in March 1967, left no doubt that those aboard the UFOs were intent on disrupting the functionality of American ICBMs in their underground silos. But Fiegel was not the only one to be told that a UFO was in the vicinity during the incident. Former Minuteman electromechanical technician Henry Barlow, who helped restart some of the stricken missiles, was informed that the mysterious aerial craft had actually caused the problem. Job control called and said, um, we have a problem at Echo Flight, and four or five missiles, or six missiles, just shut down simultaneously. And we want you to go to the nearest site, penetrate the site, and see what's going on. So um, on our way to the site, uh, they had called and said that the other four missiles had shut down, so that all of them were now shut down. At that time, they said UFO activity in the area, and we had heard this on and off for many times when we were out at the missile sites that job control would call and say, you know, we, we have reports of UFO activity in your area, keep your eyes open. And I think we covered three or four sites, uh, and they were sending other teams out from the base. We had to go to Echo One uh, to stay for the night there and uh, get eight hours of sleep before we headed back to the base. So when we got in there, there was hardly room to walk in there because there was so much brass. And we heard that there was a, a UFO spotted over Echo 2, which is the most northern site in the Echo flight. In 1997, missile engineer Robert Kaminsky who headed the Boeing Company team tasked with investigating the missile shutdown incident at Echo Flight, wrote to researcher Jim Klotz, saying that no prosaic cause for the failures could be found. Importantly, the retired engineer also said he had been informed that a UFO was responsible for the missile malfunctions. But the excitement was not yet over. A second ICBM shutdown incident occurred eight days later, on March 24, 1967, 
at Oscar flight, according to former Minuteman missile launch officer Captain Robert Salas, who was on alert when it occurred. This was the event discussed by Salas at the September 2010 press conference in Washington, D.C. Salas's testimony has been confirmed by former Minuteman missile targeting officer Captain Robert Jameson, who helped retarget some of the Oscar flight ICBMs. In March of 1967, I was on alert for dispatch. And that evening, I got a call from Job Control saying, a missile going down in Oscar flight, go out and restart it. So I had called my team together. We went down to the hangar. I was told that a UFO caused all 10 missiles in Oscar flight to go down. Although this ominous situation undoubtedly concerned those in the know at the Pentagon, the chief of Project Blue Book, Major Hector Quintanilla, nevertheless presented a brave face when he spoke with reporters in response to a public uproar over nationwide UFO sightings. After almost 20 years and after having investigated over 9,000 cases, the Air Force has determined that the UFO phenomenon does not present a threat to the national security of the United States. These same claims were made when the Air Force announced the closure of Blue Book in December 1969, at which time it again emphasized that no evidence existed to indicate that UFOs posed a threat to the country's security. While many Americans may have believed this to be true, in reality, the UFOs continued to monitor our nuclear weapons program, as this Reuter News Agency article confirms. In August 1973, one of the mysterious craft, dubbed a ghost ship, was tracked on radar maneuvering near a dummy nuclear warhead in flight as it raced toward a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean near Kwajalein Atoll. This story cited information from unnamed scientists working for the U.S. Army's ballistic missile program. This intriguing report suggests that the earlier Big Sur incident, as revealed by former U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Robert Jacobs and retired Major Florenz Mansman, was not unique. Although this weapons test a decade later was apparently successful, it's clear that UFOs have maneuvered near our dummy nuclear warheads in flight on more than one occasion. In the years that followed, other UFO incidents continued to occur at various nukes-related locations throughout the U.S. According to declassified documents, two B-52 bomber bases, Loring Air Force Base, Maine, and Wurtsmith Air Force Base, Michigan, were targeted by unknown aerial craft in late October 1975. Although initial reports referred to unidentified helicopters, one witness at Loring, Sergeant Stephen Eichner, later wrote that he had observed, quote, an elongated football as long as four cars and reddish-orange in color, briefly hovering near the nuclear weapons storage area. The object then zoomed away. One week later, back at Malmstrom Air Force Base, as many as seven UFOs were sighted and tracked on radar as they intermittently maneuvered near and hovered above various Minuteman missile sites over a several hour period. According to numerous North American Aerospace Defense Command log entries released via the Freedom of Information Act, the UFOs were also unsuccessfully pursued by F-106 jet fighters before finally leaving the vicinity. One of the craft was apparently close enough to the ground to be described by security forces as a, quote, orange-white disc object. At the Pentagon, the National Military Command Center was so alarmed by the UFO incursions at Strategic Air Command bomber and missile bases that a Security Option 3 order was issued, placing the Air Force's entire nuclear weapons force on high alert. Despite official efforts to suppress the facts, all of this eventually became known as military and intelligence agency files were involuntarily released to the public via the Freedom of Information Act. If all of this were not enough, the next major UFO event really rocked the Pentagon. In late 1980, at the RAF Bentwaters base in Suffolk, England, then leased by the U.S. Air Force, a series of bizarre incidents left no doubt 
that something very strange was taking place. In the early hours of December 26th, a small group of Air Force security policemen noticed an unusual light in nearby Rendlesham Forest. They approached it on foot, only to discover a strange, triangular-shaped craft. After an indeterminate period of time, the unknown object silently raced skyward and disappeared. Two nights later, RAF Bentwater's Deputy Base Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt, was informed that another mysterious light had suddenly appeared in the forest. Halt quickly assembled a small team of security policemen to investigate. After some time, the men observed an object that looked like a large eyeball moving through the trees. At one point, material resembling molten metal was seen dripping from it. Suddenly, the object split into five smaller, disc-shaped craft, which silently scattered in all directions. A short time later, another disc raced toward Colonel Halt and his team, abruptly stopped above them, and directed a laser-like beam toward the ground very near their feet. After a few seconds, the beam clicked off, and the craft rapidly receded into the sky, moving in the direction of the RAF Bentwater's weapons storage area, which was at the time the largest American tactical nuclear bomb depot in Europe. As this was occurring, Colonel Halt began hearing excited radio chatter from security guards at the weapons facility, indicating that the UFO was sending down laser-like beams into, or near, the storage bunker complex. In 2007, Robert Hastings located and interviewed the two retired Air Force air traffic controllers who had been on duty at the Bentwaters Tower that week. Ike Barker and Jim Carey divulged for the first time they had actually tracked a bona fide UFO on radar the night that Colonel Halt was in the woods. I was just sitting there and I happened to see a, uh, a dot come on the scope and it just went like, one dot at the beginning, then another dot, another dot, and it was gone. So the scope is 120 miles across. It was just phenomenal to me to see it go that fast. All of a sudden, here it come back across again. It went one, two, and then it made the immediate right-hand turn and came right towards the base. You know, I just said, that can't be one of ours. No jet at that speed can make an immediate right-hand turn. Just absolutely phenomenal. It's not like any radar target I've ever seen. When the sweep would hit the target, you would have the entire back of it would be like a solid line traveling at an extremely high rate of speed. It passed over the control tower and then it stopped. I've never seen anything in my life like the maneuverability that happened with this object. It was an orangish color sort of popped into my mind at the time that somebody's flying a basketball out here. There were like lights around the center of it, but it wasn't like running lights or navigational lights. It was more like portholes, and then you were seeing the light from the inside coming out. It wasn't, you know, flashing lights or anything, but it hovered momentarily, reversed its course, and went back out at a high rate of speed. Moreover, Given the dramatic incident at the weapons storage area, when one of those UFOs reportedly directed laser-like beams down into the facility, it becomes clear that this case had a nuclear weapons connection. Significantly, another nukes-related incident in the former Soviet Union is nearly identical to Bentwater's. Government documents obtained by Western journalists after the collapse of the Soviet regime confirm numerous cases of UFO activity in that country during the Cold War era, including one at the Kapustin Yar military complex. On the night of July 28, 1989, a disc-shaped object with a dome was observed by dozens of Soviet Army personnel as it briefly hovered over the base's nuclear missile warhead depot. According to one KGB report, as the stunned witnesses watched, the UFO directed laser-like beams onto the roof of a building in which those weapons were kept before silently racing away. Another incident in the Soviet Union seven years earlier was even more shocking. 
On October 4th, 1982, a huge flying disk apparently activated several nuclear missiles, which were then preparing to launch. According to the Soviet Ministry of Defense documents secured by American television investigative reporter George Knapp, the UFO appeared over an intermediate range missile base near the Ukrainian town of Bailokorovish. At one point, down in the underground launch control capsule, several missiles suddenly went into countdown mode. Although no one had input the authorization codes, the missiles were preparing to launch. Then, after 15 terrifying seconds, the anomaly ceased and everything returned to normal operational status. This potentially disastrous incident was nearly identical to one reported to Robert Hastings by former U.S. Air Force Launch Officer David Schur, who said that a UFO had activated the launch sequence in several of his Minuteman missiles at Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, one night in 1966. As this object passed over the missile site, we would start getting erratic indications on that missile. The bad thing was we also got a launch indicator. Does that mean that the launch sequence has been triggered? That means that the missile has received the launch signal. In that case, Schur and his commander had to flip an inhibit switch to disrupt the unauthorized countdown. But were those aboard the UFOs actually trying to start a nuclear war? Having investigated these incidents for decades, my opinion is that those who pilot the UFOs are visitors from elsewhere who are engaged in these provocative actions at American and Russian nuclear missile sites to send us a message that we humans are playing with fire, that to engage in nuclear warfare is essentially suicide. Importantly, these dramatic incidents continue to occur long after the end of the Cold War. Several U.S. Air Force veterans have reported new UFO incursions at nuclear missile sites and weapons storage areas in the very recent past. The most important case occurred on October 23, 2010. This is CNN Breaking News. The breaking news involves a power failure that shut down a major part of the U.S. nuclear missile arsenal. Let's go to our Pentagon correspondent, Chris Lawrence. Wow, Chris, what, what do we know? Well, Wolf, this happened out in Warren Air Force Base out in Wyoming, and, and bottom line is this. For less than an hour, about an hour on Saturday, uh, the base lost primary communication with about 50 intercontinental ballistic missiles. Although widespread media coverage of the incident contained no hint of any UFO reports, a subsequent investigation yielded intriguing information about a series of still unexplained sightings occurring during the communications disruption. According to confidential Air Force sources known to Robert Hastings, various missile maintenance teams responding to the problem reported observing a huge cigar-shaped object maneuvering in the sky above the missile field. These persons emphatically state that the craft was not a blimp because no passenger gondola, propellers, or stabilizing tail fins were visible, and there was no corporate logo or other advertising on its hull. The anomalous nature of the object was all but confirmed when these teams returned to the base. According to Hastings sources, the entire missile maintenance squadron was sternly admonished by its commander not to talk to journalists or researchers about, quote, the things they may or may not have seen in the sky. Despite these revelations, the Air Force officially maintains that the massive communications disruption was caused by an improperly replaced circuit card following repairs on a weapons system processor. Nevertheless, key personnel who were in a position to know the facts have described multiple independent UFO reports during the incident, which were allegedly suppressed by command level officers. This program has only scratched the surface. Declassified documents and eyewitness testimony suggests that incidents involving UFO activity at nuclear weapons sites now number in the hundreds. Robert Hastings has urged military veterans to contact him at his website regarding their knowledge of these events 
so that a more complete picture of the situation can emerge. He believes that people everywhere have a right to know the facts. This is history, hidden history to be sure, but tremendously important. Scientists laugh at UFOs, the media generally ignore them. Billions of people worldwide think this subject is nonsense. And yet, what has been unfolding behind the scenes for more than half a century is nothing less than astounding.